So I'll go ahead and start um, uh, uh, the introduction. So um, basically, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to get a chance to work with Francois and Phil and have um, managed, and I don't always do this so well, to navigate it, to not step on their toes very much. And, um, and, um, and really, I think um, that uh, what I'm going to be showing here in a second, um, uh, I feel, is to leverage this uh, technology they just showed. Um, and, and I think that it is um, very transformational in terms of what we're going to be able to do um, for um, uh, the study of HIV. And really what it comes down to is um, you have this whole animal, uh, rhesus macaque, and there's something happening there that's very important. And it's, it's, it all starts with an infection of a cell that's, uh, and that virus spreads. So if you can find that spot where this is happening, then it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, beneficial. And, um, so, and I want to also comment that the group here has just um, been really quite extraordinary in terms of, of getting this to come together here. And this, for the first time now, has um, uh, some audio that I hope is going to work. So we will see uh, soon. Where does that got to go? I'll just use that and, and push the button. So we're good. All right, great. Wait. I, okay, I think that's turned on now. All right. All right, thank you. So, so what we can um, see here is just the, um, the different modalities of imaging now. So historically, we had done a lot of uh, basic fluorescence kind of imaging, maybe delved into EM a little bit. Um, but um, after spending um, a big part of my life trying to look closer and closer, I realize now you have to step back to see how things work together. And so doing PET scans, light sheet imaging, intravital imaging, and other methods um, uh, um, can kind of get us there. So um, as I mentioned a, uh, a second ago, and maybe I can, oh, I can't touch that. All right, um, we'll just ignore this little thing here. Um, and so, um, so basically, whether it's transmission or rebound, um, the fact that we're detecting uh, typically one virus in the blood suggests that this happens from a, a single event. And, so, uh, and then if we want to stop the rebound, uh, which is the point of cure, if we want to do prevention, we kind of have to stop this initial event. And so the, 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 the more we can understand about these early steps, the better. And the challenge is then, so how do you find really rare things? You got to know where to look. And so the way that we have, um, uh, um, my, my team has worked to try to accomplish this is through uh, correlations. So uh, using this method where we could use bioluminescence and a vector, uh, this after a vaginal challenge, rectal challenge can um, uh, transduce a vector that makes luciferase to produce photons. We can take the tissue and, um, and, and get a sense of how exactly uh, uh, the place where it's getting through. And we can see these photons. We then cut it into smaller, smaller pieces. If you start with the whole animal, you can't really um, pick these little spots and get very far. But if we can use the bioluminescence to get it down to a two by two millimeter of tissue, a piece of tissue where the, um, where the excitement is, then you can go in there. And uh, a postdoc can actually uh, section through that. You know, each uh, millimeter is about 80 sections. And so you can, you can work your way through that. The downside of this is that um, photons do not do a very good job of getting through tissue, uh, maybe a millimeter if you are lucky. Um, and then this is where uh, Phil and Francois come in because now you can use radioactivity and radioactivity goes right uh, through tissue. And so we kind of do um, uh, something similar as I show. We would, we'll label uh, mixing fluorescence and, and a copper label. Uh, we instilled in this case uh, antibody rectally. Um, you can see it's in the gut. We, cut, we, we do an acropsy, we put, scan the tissue we take the areas where there's a signal, cut it up, put it in cryomop blocks, scan the blocks, and you want to screen uh, the piece of tissue that's hot there, not the ones that aren't very hot. So this gets you to the, where the action is, and then you can um, uh, um, take that little piece and go on to do some interesting things. Hopefully these are all going to work. Yes, good. Uh, so, um, so this is just an example of using bioluminescence after a rectal challenge. You can see this little spot where the um, uh, uh, bioluminescence is. We can go in there and say do uh, light sheet imaging of fluorescently tagged antibodies, and we can see how it's um, uh, coming out of the circulation, uh, moving into the mucosa, and even entering the, the mucus um, uh, in this case. We can take that same piece of tissue, process it in a different way, and do standard uh, immunofluorescence. And so this is green is SIV and, uh, and CD4 here, and we can see uh, th these cells that are infected within the tissue uh, four, um, uh, four days after challenge. We can process the tissue differently and go in and find uh, an infected T cell in the rectum of a macaque um, uh, four days post-challenge, and you can see that it's producing um, viral particles. So using this kind of method, combining the different imaging modalities, we can go from meters to nanometers in a single experiment. 
Um, yes, that's, uh, that's nine orders of magnitude of, of information. And sort of doing this, we can, um, we can start to get a sense of a number of things. So uh, in some work, we're phenotyping the first cells that are infected, and we do that with this vector, which can't replicate. So any, um, any events you can detect um, through this vector that makes uh, cherry fluorescent protein, and uh, the luciferase tells us where to look, um, uh, and this can't spread. So we, we find that it's uh, mostly TH17s that are getting infected early on and immature dendritic cells. Um, so I'll, uh, I know that uh, uh, Dr. Brench is going to like this result, the TH17. I have a result later he's not going to like very much. Um, so um, so the, the IDCs and TH17s are the early cells that are being infected. And we think that's because, uh, so, so this was nice because it agreed with published results. The immature dendritic cells are a little controversial, but we see that. And then um, I think these cells are both metabolically active, um, doing a job every day, which is why they're more sensitive to being um, infected. So, um, so now we're going to talk about the PET scans and, and this methodology. And right now we have three kinds of, of, of things we're looking at with these uh, probes. One is full-length antibodies. I'm not going to really talk about this very much. Uh, we can label the, um, the viral particle itself and see where the particle goes. And then this is the um, 7D3 um, FAB2 probe that um, uh, uh, Phil so nicely introduced. And, um, and again, the key is, so, so Phil uh, um, is, um, is the master of trying to quantify these signals, understanding the basis of this. I mostly am using this just to know where to look because that um, kind of analysis is above my pay grade. So, um, so what we really do is use it to guide us to do our fluorescence. And so uh, here's a, an example of one of the tools we developed over the years, which is uh, to get a uh, fluorescent protein within the virus to see how the virus interacts with tissue. Um, we, used, we, we found um, that uh, um, there was a lot of background here. Um, whether we um, put virus on or not, we saw little green dots. We solved that problem with the photoactivatable GFP, um, which basically you, you take a first scan and you might see a couple little spots here. Uh, that's background. You photoactivate and take the image again. The viral particle will show up on the second one. And so this is a really nice method to get us to um, be able to show there's intact viral particles. And so we, um, here's an example then when we took the copper labeled virus did a rectal installation. The first thing that's obvious is um, it's all going much further uh, up in the rectum uh, and, and the colon than we had thought. We mostly had up till now focused on about six to eight centimeters here. And uh, when we did this kind of experiment, we got a big surprise, and that was that mesenteric lymph nodes um, were getting signal early on, two hours after rectal installation, and we could um, validate that those signals were associated with intact viral particles with our photoactivatable uh, GFP. And then we could confirm this uh, by PCR and other methods. And then this just shows a, a sort of a fascinating result that we're trying to, to understand. But the presence of IgA1 or 2 actually will lead to an increased delivery uh, to the lymph nodes. And, and we, we're going to be, um, we, we kind of have some sense of how it's getting there. Um, we'll talk about that sometime in the future. Just quickly, we can freshly tag antibodies. Uh, you can put them in a ferrometer. They basically, with that tag, is stable for a long period of time. It allows us to file the antibody uh, over time, similar to what, um, what Phil was talking about. And then we can uh, do floor swapping uh, to get a sense of background versus not, the light sheet imaging, and the, and the PET CT allows us to, um, to see where the action is. We can see very different localizations, say, for instance, comparing VRCO1 to VRCO1LS, um, and then get, a, get a, uh, clues to go in and hunt down what these changes are, are doing. Uh, this is just an example of some of the neat things that we've seen. And this is um, um, how antibodies get delivered into the uh, vaginal vault and into the, the vaginal tissue. And the bottom line is we did sequential biopsies uh, after um, IV injection of fluorescently tagged antibody, 24, 48, 72 in one week. And you can see that the antibody is coming uh, from the bottom up. And then what's neat is you can use the other method, light sheet, which allows you to look over a much larger piece of tissue uh, in a different perspective. But we can see that that um, band this, this, uh, is, is uh, re recapitulated in this other uh, method. So the, the, but the thing I want to talk about is our studies of rebound. And so essentially we're, uh, and the nice is all the talks have kind of set this up. So we're looking at um, the early reservoir that's been mentioned a few times. We're starting our, uh, we're doing a very high dose, vaginal and rectal challenge simultaneously, biopsies. I'm sorry, Francois, he hates this part, but that's how we get a good, uh, good challenge. And, um, and then we um, uh, start ART on day four, uh, watch the decline of signal, and then um, after six months, we, we did a series of, of rebounds. So um, here's an example of um, uh, um, some of the animals. So this is one week uh, after um, challenge here, and you can see a very large signal in the gut. And then the second week, uh, that persists. And like others have reported with early reservoirs, we really don't see any virus uh, detectable in the blood. 
um, um, we can um, uh, collaborate with Phil. We can go in and uh, quantify all this and, and watch how the signal declines over time. And I'm really interested in which cells are making this virus. And um, just, to, just in the spirit, we were talking about sharing samples. Compared to a mouse, right, where you got like not too much tissue, I got more tissue than I know what to do with. So, um, so anyone that is interested in um, and has a neat method uh, that could take one of these hot pieces of tissue and, and use it, we're going to be doing uh, an animal on um, the 7th of, of, of October um, by this method, and this is during the decline. So come and talk to me um, if you are interested in, in getting some of these tissues. Um, so, but what, um, let's pretend six months went by, and now here's the rebound. And so we can see this is seven days post-rebound, a very robust signal. You can uh, put the tissue and see that it mostly came back in the large intestine. And you remember in this animal, this is where it went away. Um, you know, I mean, I think this is nice because it's relative uh, sizes, so you can see how much larger the gut is compared to the female reproductive tract. And these little things are lymph nodes, which are just tiny little bits of tissue. So we can then go to these hot pieces of tissue, do section, stain them for viral proteins, and, and see, the, see the, the rebound is there. And this method confirms that their method works great. So we, when the signal is there, we can go and find it. There are a couple of cases where uh, there can be phantom signals, and, um, uh, and we're trying to understand those too. So here we have a different animal, and we can see that uh, the spread uh, is different. Each, each animal is different. And, um, but the neat thing is the rebound of this animal, uh, the signal was mostly in the small intestine. And, and basically, overall, the signal tends to return, the rebound returns at the site where the signal went away when we started ARC. So the reservoir, or whatever we're dealing with here, isn't moving very far, and that is a gift, because if it's not moving far, we sort of know where to go and look for it. So, um, so now, um, uh, looking at these rebounds, um, we've seen some crazy stuff, um, and I call it the rebound zone, and let's see if this is going to work. Ah, oh, the sound's not there. All right, all right. Beyond is another dimension, a dimension of anatomy, a dimension of physiology, a dimension of tissue. It is the middle ground between the reservoir and viremia of hearts and myeloid cells. You just crossed over into the rebound zone. Welcome. All right, so the first thing that is... Um, Thank you. If you could have heard it all, it's, um, it's, it's a little better than that. But anyway, um, um, got to keep everybody interested. So, um, so one of the things that is apparent during rebound that nobody really talks about is this really screaming signal over here, which is the heart. The heart is a source of the rebound signal. Um, I, I don't have enough time to go over this um, we, uh, in too much detail, but basically here, are, here is a, a different version of the PET scans where we've removed the liver and kidney. So you can kind of see everything else is going on. And, and basically, we're finding plenty of signal around here um, uh, after six months of art. I'm not sure, um, you know, um, uh, these are not latent cells. But I think they're, they could be involved with the rebound. And, um, and then this just shows the, uh, the hearts from these different animals. So the signal, uh, the, the heart held up in terms of going away and coming back in the same spot. So it goes down, and then it, then it rebounds. And then it turns out there's a whole bunch of immunology associated with the heart. There's TH17 cells in the heart. There's tons of macrophages in the heart. Uh, we, can, we can do PCR um, in our own animals and other animals we're getting access to and find the signals within the heart. And then um, there are T cells. Uh, this is just a PCR assay um, that is uh, uh, seeing um, uh, T cell rearrangement. So this isn't the weird, that's not the weird result. This is the weird result. So, um, or the unexpected result. So um, uh, this um, was one of the first images we took standing for envelope. And you could see this cell was very large, surrounded by C3 positive T cells. This didn't look like a T cell. Um, and so we now are doing this for animals that rebounded for four, five, seven, or 10 days. And, um, and basically, the bottom line is, all these animals, we have not found an infected T cell yet. They are all not T cells. Sorry, you're not, I, this is the result I think you're not going to like. I didn't like it either. I changed religion. I, 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 I switched. I was a anti-myeloid cell relevant person, and now they're doing something really important. Because um, the data uh, made me change my mind, and, um, and, and that uh, data cannot be ignored. So, um, so here's just an example. Uh, you see a, a T cell crawling over this uh, myeloid-shaped cell. Um, we were very anxious about this at the lab, so we can show that all of these cells here that are, are rebound, in the rebound are also GAG and M positive. So this is, um, seems to be, you know, uh, uh, they're not T cells, and they're positive for GAG and M. Um, by, by all criteria, they seem to be infected cells. 
Um, and, um, and we are starting to try to phenotype these. Here's an example of a CD11 B positive uh, infected cell that's surrounded by um, some T cells. Um, you could say, well, there's no CD4 around, but there are CD4 uh, cells everywhere. Uh, that's uh, in the green here. And, um, and we can actually see these cells. There's these myeloid cells that are there that have very high levels of CD4 in the tissue. And, um, and this is just, I think, kind of amazing because you can see these, there's like CD4 T cells crawling all over uh, this myeloid cell here, just kind of crawling over it, looking at it, but not, uh, not being infected, not really seeing that envelope move into these other cells. So what is going on here? Um, we have a lot of work to do. And, um, but my sense is it might have something to do with interferon. So you have this local infection that causes a host response that generates interferons. We know that interferons can provide protection um, uh, of cells from the virus. Um, there's a lot of literature on these myeloid cells. There's all different kinds of these myeloid cells. And, and a lot of that literature talks about interferons and how it throws it off. So the idea is that um, the, under conditions that are hostile for the infection of T cells, the virus is going to sort of uh, subsist on these, these myeloid cells that, that it can't have a big burst size, it can't um, uh, expand, it can't go viremic. At some point, it could be exhaustion from interferon, which happens, uh, a variety of things, or you could just overwhelm it with a number of particles. You can beat some of these restriction factors with a number of particles. It then expands into T cells and goes on to a uh, viremia. There are some caveats here, limited number of animals, um, although we have yet to find a T cell. It's in the macaque model for everything we've discussed here. and then. Um, we're, we're going back and re -do redoing um, more things, but um, that original virus um, had a luciferase reporter in it because I wasn't confident uh, about how sensitive PET was going to be. A uh, PET is exceptionally sensitive compared to the bioluminescence, so we were moving on from that. Um, so in the rebound zone, uh, we need to look where action is taking place, and it's different for each animal. Um, the blood is not an accurate representation of what is happening. Uh, the host environment is impacting the behavior of the virus. Uh, the known cardiovascular morbidities um, associated with HIV infection, even under ART, may be more of a myocarditis kind of a situation than um, general systemic inflammation. And then early rebound sequestration in the myeloid compartment may represent a vulnerability of, of the virus. And then um, this is the, the, the part of a program project grant uh, studying rebound, and this is the, the team, all of these collaborators, and I would not be able to do any of this without Francois and uh, Phil's uh, guidance and assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for an entertaining presentation. Uh, I think I was on time, too. Uh, uh, Brigitte Sanders from NIAD. Um, so the myeloid cell uh, story, that's in SIV, is that correct? Yes. But I don't think anybody doubts that SIV goes into uh, macrophages because it has VPX. I mean, the question is more whether HIV goes into macrophages, I think. No, uh, no. There are papers saying that the um, the evidence for T cell or myeloid cells being infected are actually myeloid cells that ate uh, infected T cells. Um, um, is the is is one of the models that's out there? Yeah, no. I mean, I I know all of those data, but I think there's still some debate um, to say it cor politically correctly uh, whether my, how much macrophages play a role in HIV infection. I think that's still not. I, I agree with you there, and, um, and I think that we can use some of these methods to kind of um, begin to look at what's happening in humans and to ask these sorts of questions. And my, my other question was, do you have any data in the Hatziano model? Because she uses uh, HIV, there is no VPX. So I think we could look you know, into, in that model in pigtails um, to see whether macrophages are infected. I talked to Theodora, she says that macrophages are infected. but. I'm not sure whether you guys are collaborating or she has any PET imaging data. Um, you saw what I got, and but we can easily, um, uh, you know, I know Theodora quite well, and as we understand better what's going on here, we can start to look at other viruses and other circumstances. Thank you. We also have Bruce's model, which is similar. Yeah. Uh, and he's mostly for our editor. We have the, uh, the similar model from Bruce uh, Rupert, and he's mostly just moved to NERC. Okay. Tom, do you have any do you have any direct data showing that there was red cells that virus is infectious? Um, actually, I loved um, Brandon's data earlier today because he showed that the early reservoir, and that was part of the reason we did this, doesn't really have a lot of mutant proviruses. They tend to be full length; they're intact. We haven't let these things accumulate. We haven't let these things be selected for. So, so that's a spreading infection, and. 
So the downside is it doesn't. I don't. I'm a pathologist. You can't tell me that it's spreading the infection without showing. I showed that the rebound signal went up significantly, and where the rebound signal told me it was, I found a whole bunch of, of cells. We'll, we'll dissect it. It's, you know, um, find something else to complain about. It's, um, we, we got this one beat. We got that one beat. I, my challenge is to find the reservoir, which there's a plan for, but this is rebound, and I think the, the advantage there is that's a spreading infection. There's a bunch of cells next to each other that are infected. Um, I don't know what you can do better than that. 